Welcome to Seasoned, everybody. I'm Chef Plum. Marisol will be joining us here very, very shortly. She's stuck in the wonderful world of traffic that is New Haven because we are live in our studio at Gateway Community College, and we are ready to talk with you. Did you know that more than 300,000 Puerto Ricans call Connecticut home? What's your connection to Puerto Rican food? Did you grow up eating your mother's rice and beans and think that they're the best thing on the planet? I do love rice and beans, that's for sure. We want to talk with you this hour about pernil and tostones and mofongo and all of the classic Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican dishes. And what's the best Puerto Rican food in the state? I know I have some ideas for sure. The number to call to join us on air is 203-776-9677 or 203-776-WNPR if you prefer to use letters on your phone instead of the numbers. It's not just Marisol and I who will be taking your calls. We're lucky enough to have on Zoom not one, but two guests who are joining us for the celebration of Puerto Rican food, and we're very, very excited to have them. Chef Maria Mercedes Grubb is joining us from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Maria is a James Beard Award nominating chef, and she's currently the executive chef of Tabernia Medaya. She's going to kill me for if I mess that up. I know it. And she also is in charge of all the food service for the Decanter Hotel in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Welcome, chef. Hi there, how you doing? We are very excited to hang out with you. We're also joined with Vaughn Diaz. She's a writer, documentarian, and professor of food studies at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And Vaughn is the author of Coconuts and Collards, Recipes from Puerto Rico to the Deep South. Vaughn Diaz, welcome to Seasoned. Thanks for having me, Chef. All right, friends, I'm so excited to have you both here. I cannot wait to get deep, deep into this, but we want to let our, you know, people understand and learn a little bit more about you and talk to you possibly. So I want to give the number so they can call us and talk to you and talk about their favorite Puerto Rican dishes. And also like, tell us why their mother's rice and beans is better than, you know, maybe my mom's rice and beans. The number is 203-776-9677 or 203-776-WNPR. All right, friends, let's take a deep dive into this really quick. Let's talk for a second about what we mean when we talk about what Puerto Rican food is and what it is to each of us, I should say. And I know Puerto Rican food for tourists is a lot different than Puerto Rican food like eating at kitchen tables on the island. So let's get into it. Maria, let's start with you. When you think of Puerto Rican food, what comes to mind? I mean, when I think of Puerto Rican food, um, you have to think of the influences. Uh, we have the, the natives that were here before, which is the Taino. Mm -hmm. um, then we had the Spanish influence. Um, so that definitely took, uh, brought the pig and all that stuff that we love now. And then we have the African where we get the plantain. So you kind of have to add them all three. Um, I would say that what marries everything is the sofrito, which definitely is kind of like our take on a mirepoix um, French style or even like an Italian sofrito. Yeah, and mirepoix generally is like your starting point, your, your carrots, your onions, your celery. But sofrito, a little bit different, right, Maria? 100%. Um, we use um, a recao, which is like a type of um, cilantro with a, with a wider leaf. We use ají dulce, which is kind of like a sweet pepper. And then we also use cubanel peppers. And then the Spanish influence comes in like the garlic and the onion. Blend that all in. And that's like basically the base for everything that goes on in this island. I mean, I kind of would just want that right now. That sounds delicious for sure. Vaughn, <laughs> how about you? What does Puerto Rican food mean to you? You know, um, Puerto Rican food has multiple layers of significance to me um, because even though I grew up largely stateside, I grew up largely um, in the American South outside of Atlanta, um, Puerto Rico is where my heart lives. I was born there, but I moved when I was very young and food continues to be my tether to the island. Mm -hmm. um, it's consistently a portal to another time, to to another place, to people, to music, to laughter. And and so the, the smells, the flavors and the context that Maria shared are all all things that um, that you know that connect me to the island, even when I'm not there. Food can do a lot of that. It can you know, it connects me to where I'm from down south, and you know it, it's very powerful like that. Uh, let's talk about staples in a pantry. We talked a little bit about a sofrito, but Maria, what are some of those staples in a Puerto Rican pantry? You gotta have spices too. There's the I would say like the prime one, at least for me, um, is it would be the oregano. The oregano here is a little different. Yeah, it is. Different. Um, it, it, it gets dried out and that's always like the common spice. It's also a lot of cumin gets used a lot too. Um, and then you have like the dry version, which is like an adobo. Usually it has like garlic powder, onion powder. Um, some people put pepper, even though that's not really quite Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of like a house mix that everybody has in their pantry ready to go. And then that usually is the base for most of the stuff that goes on. Oh, and tomato paste. We use a lot of tomato paste too. Yeah, uh, Vaughn, what else do we need in there? What did Maria miss? 
All of those things for sure. Also sazon, which similar to adobo is a dried sp um, spice blend. Um, often one of the key ingredients is anato, which is a dried um, uh, ground anato seeds, mm -hmm. which actually don't have much of a flavor, but they provide this really beautiful, robust red, orangey kind of yellow color. Um, I would also say pimento stuffed olives. Um, a pl uh, black raisins are something that end up in our food quite often. And I would add to the pantry staples, even though I know this can be a little controversial, um, all levels of tinned meats, spam, Vienna sausages, corned beef, um, things that maybe folks might turn their, their nose to, but that are, you know, things that I grew up eating that I think are actually really quite delicious. Don't sleep on spam. It's delicious. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Don't sleep well, that's on definitely the, that Spanish influence. I mean, sorry, the United States influence. All that stuff came during that era. And yeah. it's definitely part of the lexicon now, too. I think that adobo is one of those spices that, you know, most American kitchens don't have in them or, you know, home cooks, pantries don't have but should because what an easy spice to put onto some chicken you're going to grill or, you know, something you're going to roast in the oven. It's such a versatile, adds so much flavor. And it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to use. I, I totally agree. And, I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about adobo and sazon because sometimes, well, I, I think that often the food ways of, of cultures like Puerto Rican cultures and other black and brown cultures across the U.S., um, a lot of times our food ways are not necessarily respected. They're not celebrated. They're not thought of as elegant. Um, and um, and in some ways, I've often heard adobo and sazon sort of described as like a cheat, right, as like a lazy way to add flavor. Right. And I really want to push against that because I'd like no, it's genius. It's genius because you can take sazon, add it to a number of different kinds of acids and then or different kinds of oils, right? And turn it into a complete, you can sort of change the, the profile of this spice blend because it's, it's a start, right? It's just the start of a flavor that you can then layer with other flavors. And so, you know, I, I, I use both of those spices constantly in my kitchen. I put them on, I put it on potatoes. I put it on chicken. Um, I even, <laughs> I got sazon once and I um, I did a recipe for um, pimento cheese, Puerto Rican pimento cheese, which was literally pimento cheese with sazon added to it. And, really? Um, and listen, it's delicious. I mean, don't, it sounds don't, great. Uh, yeah, as Maria said, don't sleep on that. Yeah. No, not at all. Sazon is very essential. And you know, it's so funny that you mentioned that I'm calling that a cheat. These are probably the same people that have no problem doing a dry rub to follow yeah. like a Southern style recipe for like ribs or something like exactly. that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Especially with the beautiful access that we have now to dried spices of high quality, you can make like a superb sazon that's just ready to go in your pantry. I love that. And that's a great tip too to have because I mean, we, we really do. We can get dry spices. I mean, great dry spices from all over the place. I use a company called Spiceology. It's fantastic stuff. Uh, Maria, help us understand the pull of the island. I mean, for those of you who don't know, Maria's kind of a big deal. She's awesome. She's, I mean, <laughs> seriously, it's a little bit nervous. I get a little nervous whenever I talk to her, and we're friends, too, outside of this. But every time I talk to her, I get a little bit nervous. I kind of have to look at the ground, you know. But uh, you're, you're such a renowned <laughs> chef. You're the first Puerto Rican woman to be nominated for a James Beard Award. You attended the International Culinary Center in New York. You've cooked in some of the best kitchens in the city. I mean, Puerto Rico has been through it. Bankruptcies, hurricanes, earthquakes, pandemic. You could cook anywhere in the world. What is it about Puerto Rico that inspires you to stay? I mean, well, first of all, it's family. I think like the Puerto Rican culture, everything comes down to being around family. So that's like number one. Uh, number two is, is the comfort of the land, you know, just knowing what you and the connections, the connections that you make while you're working here with your distributors and, and just that love that you see of people trying to keep it alive and just keep cultivating beautiful vegetables and, and just that dedication to survive on this island. It, it's something that inspires me to just stay and be here. I love it. Well, listen, we're going to take a quick, short break. Emily, I see you on hold. We're going to get to you as well. You can give us a call and tell us about your favorite Puerto Rican restaurant across the state. Our number is 203-776-9677 or 203-776-WNBR. You're checking out Seasoned. We'll be right back. Stay right there. Welcome back to Season. I'm Chef Plum, and I'm joined now by my fabulous co-host, 
the one and only Midasol Castro. Thanks for joining us. What was the traffic? What was it? It was Mercurius in retrograde. Ah, that is what it was. Got it, uh, got it. Yes. My apologies to our humble listeners and to our fantastic guests who it are happens. joining us from far and wide. Well, I know you know Vaughn, but I want to introduce you to Chef Maria Grubb as well. Um, we are talking all about wonderful, wonderful Spanish food. I brought empanadas. Did you see them? I did not. You ran right in. But for the, I just came in. <laughs> Thank you, Maria and Vaughn, for joining us. And if you are just joining us, we are dedicating this episode to all things Puerto Rico. And I know that we have made a shout out to some of our listeners for some of your favorite Puerto Rican restaurants throughout the state. And I believe we have a caller. We do. Let's talk to Emily here in Burlington. Emily, welcome to Season. Hi, Chef Vaughn. Hi, Mary Saul. Hi. How are you? I'm well. How are you? We are excited to talk to you. I, I see you have a great recommendation of a restaurant that I'm very familiar with, so tell us about it. Oh, my God. Yes. So my sister works in New Britain, and she just finds, like, the best restaurants. And one of her recommendations was Mafongo in downtown New Britain. Great spot. Fantastic spot. Do you have a favorite that dish was- there? Yeah. Oh, me? me uh, I'm vegetarian. I recently went vegetarian, so, like... Uh, but I always loved the pork there, the pernil, I think, with the uh, plantains. was, like, always smoking, like, crazy good. I just, like, I, whenever I walk in, my boyfriend is just eat, eat, So I'm always, like, hovering over his meal. Awesome. That sounds delicious. Emily, thank you very, very much. We appreciate it. And we want to hear all the shouts we possibly can. Right? So people give us a, you guys can give us a shout out uh, or give us a call at 203-776-9677 or 203 776 uh, WNPR. We've also, let's just do one more. How about that? Let's go to Mary Jane. She's calling us from North Stonington. Hi, Mary Jane. Welcome to Season. Oh, How hi. Are you? I, I just wanted to give a little plug to my college, Southern Connecticut State University. Back in 1965, they would send people to Puerto Rico for an entire summer just for culture. And I also want to know what's the spices for Puerto Rican rice and beans? Is it chili or something else? We have some experts who can answer we, that. We do have some experts. So, uh, Maria, Vaughn, who wants to take this? I'm, I'm going to let Chef take this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, this is a complex question. I guess uh, you do, if you want to do a mix of both of them, then you're going to need, um, like Vaughn mentioned, a little bit of like sazon with achote. Um, then you want to need a little bit of sofrito, which is that um, veggie, veggie mix that I explained at the beginning. Um, some people use chicken stock. Some people use um, chicken bouillon. That's a very um, uh, complex question as well. <laughs> but um, those are like the main the main ingredients that you would need for like the rice and beans mix. I would I would tend to agree. And I know I was listening in when we started the show, and you all were talking about sofrito mm. and van. I have to confess, there's now mm. a rift between me and my mother. Because Uh-oh. I use your sofrito recipe. Uh oh, bendito sea. No, y me dice, y ve acá, muchacha, de dónde salió este, este sofrito <laughs> en la nevera, which is loosely translated, hey, dummy, what is this new I sofrito? That. <laughs> that. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, but she loved it. I so, hate to be the cause of a rift. Listen, it, it's the cause of many rifts. I've given that woman every last gray hair. But, um, you know, we obviously this show is, is centered on food. And we all know that food has so many different complexities to it. It brings us together culturally, politically, uh, and all the rest. Puerto Rico has such a complicated Mm -hmm. history. And we can't think about or speak about Puerto Rico without bringing in two key words, which is sovereignty and colonialism. So, Vaughn, I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking to us about the complexities of the food of Puerto Rico, uh, because it is so mired or steeped in its very complicated history. Definitely. And I'm, I'm going to invite Maria to, to pipe in as a person who has lived on the island much, 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 much longer than, than I have um, and lives there today. And, you know, I think when I, um, when I start a class, um, I teach food studies at UNC Chapel Hill, I usually start my class with this sort of singular fact, which is that what we know about history is always predicated by those who were documenting, mm-hmm. right? And so this is a tricky thing when it comes to, to, to the food of Puerto Rico, because 
because in this case, much of what we know about the food and culture of the indigenous Tainos or the first enslaved workers who were brought to the island is through the eyes of the colonizer, right? And, and, and to be frank, they weren't particularly interested in documenting the complexities, the intricacies of the food ways of these very beautiful, vibrant cultures who had, um, you know, who, who made really delicious things using incredibly resilient cooking techniques. And so um, one of the things um, that I've noticed over the years is that Puerto Rican food is often sort of typecast, right? It's very heavy. Mm-hmm. It's very filling. It's not healthy. And, and I, I, I like to trouble that way of thinking as often as possible, because what we do know about the way that many, many, many um, people lived on the island of Puerto Rico for generations is that they experienced a tremendous amount of poverty. The island um, was turned into basically a giant cash crop, right? It was a, a cane sugar colony. And so um, the people of Puerto Rico for generations were engaged in some way in, in, in agricultural labor. And we know this actually from all over the planet, right? Wherever we have a culture that does a lot of hard labor, what you need is a meal that is nourishing and is going to stick to your ribs, right? It needs to be filling to prepare you for a long day of work. And so you see this a lot in sort of the most traditional Puerto Rican dishes, um, lots and lots of root vegetables that sometimes are just, you know, boiled and then maybe um, seasoned with a bit of a mojo, which has garlic, maybe some onions, um, olive oil. My grandmother made hers with whole peppercorns and, and maybe a bit of citrus, right? It's pretty adaptable. Yeah. And so we know that um, that folks for generations have eaten a lot of what we call viandas in mm-hmm. Puerto Rico, which are all all nature of different root vegetables. Um, but interestingly, right, there are so many ingredients in Puerto Rico that are that were brought to the island specifically to feed enslaved workers, again, with the purpose of being filling. Rice is one of those. Plantains are actually not indigenous to the island. They were brought to the island to feed workers. And so, um, you know, in I, I encourage people to, instead of when looking at Puerto Rican food potentially as heavy or unhealthy, to instead see, um, it, you know, um, um, innovation, creativity, mm-hmm. tenacity, um, and 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 deep resilience in terms of how to make food incredibly delicious with limited resources and tools, um, and also to mention right living on an island that is environmentally vulnerable that experiences storms frequently. Um, so those are those are some of the things I think of in terms of the the history of food on the island. I like how she said, you know, have these stick to your bones kind of food for a hard day's work. Um, I'm definitely going to use that to my wife when I have dinner tonight. And she's like, why are you having your fifth plate of food? Well, right. you know, it's going to be a hard day's work at some point. I don't know. Maria, we talked a little bit about the foundation ingredients and we talked about some of our uh, signature dishes. But when we say Puerto Rican food to most people, they think pernil, mofongo, empanadas. Can we talk about these classics a little bit and what makes them delicious? I mean, those are like the classics um, in the sense that that's what everybody knows, but there's way more than that, you know, like the mofongo, to be honest with you, people don't really make that at home. That's something that you go out. Thank you for saying that because people come to my house, you don't have mofongo. I'm like, I'm sorry. You want me to slave over a a hot stove for hours and hours and hours? No, thank you. You can go to a restaurant and order it. Maria, can you tell people people what mofongo mofongo is before we, uh, you know? Oh, of course. Uh, Mofongo is basically um, like bonsai plantains, which came with the Africans, and they fried a lot of stuff, you know, so that definitely seeped into our culture so it's fried plantains and then people add to that chicharron which is like pork crackling uh, some garlic and back in the day they would serve it with like a little consomme of of some sort um super traditional but the dish has definitely evolved um then the pigeon peas are huge here uh pigeon peas being like a type of lentil Mm -hmm. which we call gandules arroz con gandules is definitely a quintessential and then the pernil, which came with Spain, you know, but it's um, another big feast type of animal and um, something that gets seasoned with like local ingredients like um, like dry oregano, maybe some sour orange, um, garlic for sure. And it's like slow roasted and then you get this crackling, beautiful skin. And those are like the main things. But then there's other things like um, we have the pasteles, which I think are huge and and they're very special and something that people labor over and they, they wrap like little tamal gifts and it's something that pops around Christmas but that everybody like yearns and, and goes crazy over once a year. Yeah, you so can't the, the, you'd be hard pressed to find 
a Puerto Rican on the mainland that doesn't have at least a stack of six pasteles in his or her freezer. That's amazing. From Christmas, because you have to be ready to pull them out and boil them and eat them and yeah. serve them to a guest. That sounds Definitely. Yeah. That sounds those are essentials. Right. Yeah. <laughs> those are the essentials. Um, but then again, these are all very uh, filling meals, and it's something that uh, everything comes from like some humble beginning, kind of like, like have you seen the South in, in the United States, you know, how the, the black community came up with all these wonderful things like fried chicken and and pig's feet and all that wonderful food as well. This is the moment in our episode where my stomach starts growling because I'm, <laughs> because I'm thinking of all the food. For those of us, to, uh, those of you just joining us, we are dedicating this episode of Season to Puerto Rico, and we are we have the distinct pleasure of being joined by Chef Maria Mercedes Grub, all the way from San Juan, Puerto Rico, and Von Diaz, a professor of food studies and author and cook herself. So, if you have a question for either Maria or Von, or you want to shout out one of your favorite Puerto Rican restaurants in this fine state, give us a call: two zero three seven seven six. 9677. The number again is 203-776-WNPR. It's interesting we talk about the food being heavy. Mm. Um, and root vegetables, by their very nature, are, are heavy. It just sounds heavy. What I've noticed in the recent years, in full transparency, I'm Puerto Rico by way of the Bronx. My parents were born and raised in Mayagüez, Puerto Rico. Half of my family is still there. Uh, but I grew up, you know, very much a New Yorican. Be that as it may... I always wondered, I, w- I would often ask my family, where are all the farmers on the island? You know, like, my, my cousins are, they're police officers, they're lawyers, they're nurses, but where are all the farmers? And I, I wonder, you know, we talk about the climate of Puerto Rico. We talked about all the, the, the hurricanes that have come. My understanding is that this disruption has actually helped some of the vegetation in, in Puerto Rico. And I wonder if one, either one of you can talk about that and how that has sort of changed the way the island thinks about what they are eating. Because there is a huge vegan movement happening in in Puerto Rico. There there didn't used to be farmer's markets. And now suddenly there are farmer's markets, which to me blows my mind that we're now seeing farmer's markets in Puerto Rico in 2022. Maria, can you you talk to us about that? I mean, it's it's fantastic. And like Vaughn was talking about history, it all happened, you know, United States becomes, you know, we become United States territory. And what happened with industrialization around the 50s, people were pretty much told to like stop working in the fields. That's like low jobs. You shouldn't be farming. You shouldn't be growing and you shouldn't be working with cows. You should be going to universities. Mm-hmm. And there was this massive exodus of people just going to the to cities or maybe leaving Puerto Rico and becoming educated, and like you said, everybody got the, the blue collar jobs and the farms emptied out and closed down. Um, but now there's a new resurgence of people just like wanting quality food and just feeling that connection to the island. And also, like you said, about having independence and food is independence. So 90% of the food is in, imported to Puerto Rico. So there's a resurgence of people just being like, yo, we need to make our own food because we can't just sit here waiting for food that's actually taxed by the Jones Act. So it's a very complex thing. And there's definitely people that care. They're making these great strides to produce beautiful vegetables and going back to literally to roots. Thank you for that, Maria. Um, I want to add a little bit to what she shared because that's spot on. And and to explain a little bit what adds another layer of complexity to agriculture on the island. Um, as I as I mentioned earlier, right, Puerto Rico was was de- was developed as a cane sugar colony, right? And so much of the arable land on the island was used to cultivate that specific crop. In in the in the the decades, the generations, the centuries since, right, there hasn't been a wide spread national initiative to transform this arguably fertile arable land into food for the people. And what's um, fascinating and brilliant and inspiring to me is that what I've seen over the years is um, particularly young folks, but also folks who like people, Puerto Ricanos who've been on the island for generations, starting to take back their land and to begin to cultivate things on the island that have not been grown there before, not because they don't grow well, 
there, but because they weren't ever prioritized, right? They were never, um, that wasn't the focus of the government. Um, and it never has been the focus of the government to turn Puerto Rico into the pl- into a place that would be food sovereign, right? Meaning that the, the island could sustain and feed its people from what it could grow and cultivate. And, um, and the other thing, because it's often confusing to folks what exactly the Jones Act is. Um, and so it's the Jones Act is connected in, in some ways to the moment where um, Puerto Rico became a U.S. territory. But ultimately, the reason why it complicates food sovereignty on the island and actually beyond, because the Jones Act is um, also in place in Hawaii mm-hmm. and in Guam, which are both, um, you know, Hawaii is a state, but Guam is also a U.S. territory, mm-hmm. and that it uh, prohibits um, the those islands, Puerto Rico specifically, from trading internationally um, with anyone that isn't approved um, or um, by the United States, right? So there's a tremendous amount of control over who um, the who. Puerto Rico can trade with, and that limits the kinds of food that get imported, where food comes from, and has, you know, many, many people have studied how that dynamic continues to keep the island in a place where um, 90% of the food is still imported on the island. And I've seen estimates that are even larger than that. Not just that, the taxation as well. Yes. We we pay twice as much uh, pepper, bell pepper, that you can pay $2.99. One ninety nine in the states, we pay five ninety nine a pound. Yes, That's ridiculous. Yeah. What do you guys think are some of the places that they would want to trade with, or or would we want to have trade with that we can't? You know, I mean, if I may, I am not an expert on this aspect of Puerto Rico. I focus mostly on culture and yeah. history and the intersections really of those aspects with food. Um, and I I think that what I hear, and, and Maria, um, uh, you know, maybe you have more to add to this. My sense is that 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 Puerto Ricanos want to grow. They, they, they want to be food sovereign, right? Yeah. They want to have delicious, beautiful produce that comes from their fertile lands. They want to grow their own peppers. And, but the government continues to not really make a pathway for farmers to to easily cultivate land. So, I mean, that's, that's you know, I don't think it's as much like Puerto Rico wants to trade with Iceland or something. I think it's more <laughs> that, you know, it's, I think that it's right. the, the, the structure is preventing people on the island from, from, from growing their own food by making it very difficult to do so very, very, very expensive and continuing. Um, and, and, and again, Maria lives there and can speak to this more, the price of, 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 groceries is absurd. The kind of inflation that we're seeing stateside in the United States is how Puerto Ricans have been living for, for honestly, for generations. Well, to add to the who could we trade with, we have Dominican Republic 30 minutes away. Mm -hmm. Um, They, as opposite of Puerto Rico, they actually produce 90% of their food. Um, And I've met with farmers in the Dominican Republic who tell me we could send food to Puerto Rico, but before it hits Puerto Rico, it needs to go to the States. So imagine that. Imagine what condition the food will be. It's going back and then then come forward. And then it's like, um, it's ridiculous. It's half an hour away. We could be getting like beautiful, fresh produce from next door and we're not allowed to. Interesting. Interesting. Well, speaking of not sure if you should uh, be allowed to use something, I've got Matt from Newtown with a great question on sofrito. That was a segue. I love it. We need hear his question. I think it makes sense. Hey, Matt, how are you? Good. How are you? We are fantastic. So I heard you talking about sofrito recipes, and I was wondering, sometimes I'll buy the uh, sofrito in the jar that comes from Goya, mm-hmm. and I was wondering, is that acceptable, or is that like, you know, an Italian person eating SpaghettiOs? To me, and this is just my opinion, that's an Italian person <laughs> eating white bread with ketchup on it and having it pass as pizza. Oof. <laughs> Oof, oof. It's, it's, it's Prego. It's Prego. <laughs> That's for sure. It's definitely Go Prego. get Von Diaz's cookbook. It's very easy. <laughs> By the way, I'm not getting paid to say this. Her Thank recipe you. is very easy. And uh, and go make it. See how delicious it makes your food and then report back. Matt, you got to make it on your own, I think. I think you got to make it you're on your own, buddy. I, I don't think anyone's going to side with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Good luck. Oh, wow. So, Maria, I, I know that you like to experiment with, like, some Asian ingredients. And, Vaughn, you grew up in Georgia with, I mean, there's so many great Southern, you know, that's that's my bread and butter, Southern food. Are there any examples uh, in either one of you, your, your cooking styles, uh, when these influences kind of blend to make something totally unique? Maria, you can start. 
Oh, 100%. Like speaking of sofrito, um, one of the things that I love to add to my sofrito is um, yuzu kosho, which oh. is like a Japanese Ooh. spice um, mm. made with um, yuzu lemon and the kosho being like a type of um, um, chili uh, used in Japan. And I make my typical sofrito and then I like to finish it with a bit of that and it just gives, gives it a total different spin. And mm. there's a lot of other ways that it definitely sips in in my food, 100%. I love that yeah. so much. Do we have a caller? Do we have Edwin? No. We don't. We actually just lost Edwin, but he had a fantastic question. He had a fantastic question that I was so excited about. Edwin, if you can still hear us, call us back because I think this would be great fodder for Maria, Vaughn, and I. And that's a tease. Oh, okay. We have to take a quick break. Oh, but no, already? when we come back, yes, we break at 3.38. Wow, maybe more chicharrones. Talk. That'd be awesome. <laughs> when we come back, we will talk more about the wonderful food of Puerto Rico. We're joined by Von Diaz, Maria Mercedes Grab. This is Seasoned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Seasoned. I'm Chef Plum. And I'm Marisol de Castro. And Marisol, there was a, that question before the break. We lost our caller. We yes. had a great question. And you thought it was something that maybe you've, you've even heard of, right? Yeah, I've, I've definitely heard of. If you're just joining us, we're dedicating this episode to Puerto Rican food. And we are so excited to be joined by Chef Maria Mercedes Grab. She's the executive chef at Taberna Medalla and Bar Catedral in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And Von Diaz, she's a writer, documentarian, professor of food studies, at UNC Chapel Hill. She's also the author of Coconuts and Collards, Recipes from Puerto Rico to the Deep South. So women, the question we had from Edwin was, have you guys heard of adding cheese to your coffee or cheese to your chocolate caliente? Is that a thing? I've never heard of this. To which (laughs) I say, you haven't had hot chocolate unless you have had a cube of yellow cheese dropped into it. it. I mean, I've heard of cheese in with, it. like, apple pie, but... In it. Interesting. In it. Right, yes. Right. That is how I grew up, and my mother made hot chocolate. She stood over scalding milk, and she grated a bar of chocolate over the milk. Okay. And then when it was scalded, she dropped a cube of cheese. And this was, like, this was not fancy, fancy cheese. This was, like, a block of cheese. All right. And it was delicious. So that was that was what how we did it in my Puerto Rican house. Chef is making a face. I just, Maria Vaughn, am I crazy? Honestly, it, in mi vida, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna vouch on this. Um, I mean, my family is Dominican. I'm first generation Puerto Rican, um, so it's not something that my family would do. But I definitely have friends that that talk about it and actually i have a friend that has a coffee shop here a very trendy one and um he serves um he has this one chocolate that he serves with a cube of cheese on the side so that what? means there's some truth to this see there is some truth to this i just don't even know everything is going to be the same ever again now it's never going to be the same but that's know. the beauty if you have questions for von diaz or chef maria mercedes grab or you want to shout out your favorite puerto rican restaurant in connecticut give us a call we are standing by the number is 203-776-9677 that's 203-776 wnpr before we got to the co- oh we have we have another caller. Let's go to Ramona in Ellington. Ramona, welcome to Seasoned. Hi, thanks for having me. We're Hi. excited to have you. You have a fantastic <laughs> story here. Let's hear it. I do. So um, I'm an English teacher in West Hartford, and one of the classes I teach is, is world literature. And I'm first of all thrilled you're doing this show because I'm going to use it in my class. Oh, awesome! Uh, but primarily because my favorite restaurant for Puerto Rican food and for all of the cultures of my students has been them bringing food from their homes to me. Beautiful. So they'll make something, they'll bring it in, and it's just, I find that food is the quickest and most meaningful way to get people to learn about other people's culture. Absolutely. And learn about other people. And the history is so buried in there, like you were talking about the plantains not being native to the land, but, but being brought in. And so I can't wait to use this information in class, but I just, I, I love the language of food. And I love how it allows me to do my job even better because the kids just dive into it. And Shut- they're so proud. They're so proud to bring their foods in and have me try it. 
Shout out to you being a teacher. You're shout an amazing out, teacher for and that. And shout out to you That's brilliant. not being traditional and having your students' yeah. nose buried in a book. I wonder, have, have any of your students brought in any Puerto Rican food? Yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. I've gotten beans and rice. Nice. Um, I've gotten, I've, I'm trying to think. I've gotten, muf- I have had mofongo, but I think it was around the holidays. Sure. Um, they always want me to try coquito, but they can't bring that in, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a terrible idea. Um, and then I've gotten from other, I've gotten j- jola from Ghana, and I've gotten, uh, what was it, oxtail from my Jamaican students. So it's just this, I don't know there's been any better way to meet my students and get to know them and their families. Um, what, do you, what do your students call you? They call me um, Ms. Pachowski Pretty. You're a very great teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Do more episodes. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I can't thank wait to you. get the book, too. I'll be using that in class. So thank you. Amazing. We've also got Gilberto, who is on the road. Gilberto, welcome to Seasoned. One of the, one of the staples of our food, um, Puerto Rico, is uh, uh, bacalaito frito or uh, codfish fritters. Mm. Mm-hmm. I was always of the belief that since there are no codfish in the waters of Puerto Rico, uh, that was part of the of the New England triangle, if you will, of uh, bringing dry cod from the waters off of New England to feed the slaves in Puerto Rico, Cuba, uh, the Dominican Republic, etc. Any comment on that? Sure. Let's... Maria Vaughn? Yeah, I'm happy to speak a little bit about this. So um, you're 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 not far off, um, but actually uh, you should look in the other direction. Um, there's actually a great book by Mark Kurlansky called Cod that uh, explains a lot of this history. But ultimately, cod came from far northern waters. We're talking, you know, Norway, Viking territory, and 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 made its way down to Portugal and Spain, where um, ultimately it was transformed. Because one of the things about cod is that it's quite flaky, but the flesh itself is is not particularly dynamic in mm-hmm. flavor, but it is an excellent fish to salt and um, and to dry. And so salt cod became this incredible commodity um, during the slave trade in particular and made its way to Puerto Rico by way of, of Spanish colonizers. Um, but it's it's perfect in a number of ways because it, it keeps for a really long time. It has a very delicious salty flavor. And, um, and because it is dehydrated, right, um, you can rehydrate it and do certain things with it. And it makes it a really adaptive Adaptable ingredient to work with, and and again, even though we live in such modern times now, it is still very prominently, you know. My, I mean, my sense is that it's still prominently used on the islands. Oh, one hundred percent. It has so much umami, mm-hmm. so it's something that that just seeps mm-hmm. into everything. Mm-hmm. And there's many in- interpretations of dishes with cod, and like Juan said, it's mainly that Spain influence that brought it brought it in this particular case to Puerto Rico. And it's something also that it's preservation. So if you don't have a refrigerator or something, this is just also something great to have in your pantry. Yeah, absolutely. Well, excellent. There you go. I never think of cod as being a, a choice there, but I, I like how uh, Maria said it's umami, which it mm-hmm. 100% is absolutely. we got Anna calling us from Hartford. Anna, welcome to Seasons. Yes, my question is, uh, how much of the Spanier food you think we have, you know, how much influence you think our Puerto Rican food has from Spain? Great question. Uh, Maria. Maria, Vaughn? Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, our main, main dish is pernil. Yeah. That definitely came from Spain. Um, then we have the tomato paste, like to- uh, our garlic and onions. It's not something that grows here either. So that has a lot to do with our seasoning nowadays. I mean, I will say if I have to choose a percentage, and Vaughn, correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say like a solid 60% is part mm. Spain okay. in our food influence. Yeah, I think that's fair. And and I think um, I love what, what Maria pointed out in her description of specific things, because what's, um, what I think is really beautiful and where you see the hybridized, the sort of, you know, the, the cultural fusion, um, the culinary fusion of, 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 of Puerto Rican cuisine is that those elements, right, are, are flavors, right? They, they um, infuse food with a lot of flavor, tomato, olives, olive oil, right? pork used in all these different ways. And, and the way that you see that fused, right, is, is the ways in which Puerto Ricans then take those flavors and turn them into um, really dynamic dishes that reference 
all of all of those things, right? Por ejemplo, um, a sancocho, right? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. a sancocho is a big mejunje, a big sort of combination of a bunch of different ingredients, but it's like the be- one of the best representations of all of the different flavors because you'll have pork in there, maybe chicken, maybe chorizo with the foundation of sofrito. Some people put, I mean, basically people put whatever they want and then you have the classic viandas, right? The, all those root vegetables and plantains that we talked about earlier. Excellent. Uh, let's do one more call here before we jump into some more uh, uh, recipes and food. We've got Paul from New Britain. Paul, welcome to Seasoned. Hey, thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, hi, I'm an Anglo. I've been married to a Puerto Rican lady for 45 years, and um, I'm in New Britain. And, um, you know, besides falling in love with her, I also fell in love with the food. <laughs> and, um, you know, going to, to the island, we, my, my cuñados, my brothers-in-law, they took me first to uh, Piñones, it's a, like a, on the beach there. Oh, amazing, yeah. Gan, yes. Gandinga. Yep. Wow. Gandinga and Cuchifrito, which I think are tripe. You might correct me. But I just want to give a shout-out to uh, Criogissimo. That's another Puerto Rican restaurant in Britain. And down the road from them is probably the best bread in the world. It's called Borinquen Bakery. Oh. And uh, and actually, you can go to all the different markets, Sea Town, and, and you get a meal there. They've got rice, beans, and everything else. Oh, how about that? But, a... No, uh, buen provecho and gracias. Ay, buen provecho a ti. I suddenly okay. want brazo gitano, which is... Uh... Okay. We can't let Paul go yet. Are we just going to skip over the fact he says married for 45 years? Shout out to him. To a Puerto Rican woman. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, I'm yeah. saying I'm yeah. saying a novena for him Talk as we speak. Talk about resilience. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> gracias, gracias. Thanks, Paul. Wow. I love all these places. I'm, ma- I'm, taking, I'm making a list. I have a list. You know, we, um, Vaughn, when you started talking about Sancocho, uh, we'd be remiss if we did not talk about a couple of recipes because mm. our listeners love to take some good recipes and then try them at home. Can you talk to us about your grandmother and your mother's rum cake? Yes, definitely. Um, so as, as I mentioned earlier, I, I grew up largely in the American South. And um, I, you know, I always want to clarify that for folks that you know, I did not grow up on the island, which uh, not only means that I didn't necessarily taste Puerto Rican flavors all the time. I definitely did not. My mom didn't cook a lot of Puerto Rican food at home. But it also means that we did not have access to fresh ingredients that we needed to make Puerto Rican food. And so um, actually, and you can tell your mom this, in many ways, my sofrito recipe came came along because I grew up in a place where I could not find culantro, mm-hmm. I could not find um, ají dulce, I couldn't right. find cubanel peppers, right? So I was like, okay, bell pepper, cilantro, <laughs> let me just, let right. me just adjust the, right. let me adjust the proportions here so that it tastes kind of like what I remember. Um, but back to the rum cake. So you know, um, my favorite cakes, and actually my favorite cakes are Dominican cakes, and but a lot of sort of like birthday cakes in Puerto Rico, at least what I had growing up and, and what I remember, were, were had some kind of rum in it. Either, either there was rum in the batter or there was sort of rum doused on it at the end. And it's not a ton. I mean, you could put as much as you want, but, you know, it's not it's not sort of an overpowering flavor. And growing up, the uh, my mother, during the holidays, um, we grew up in a very, very, very low-income household. And so we often would bake as Christmas presents. Presents, right, like yeah. everybody got a flan, a rum cake, mm-hmm. a queso yo que diablo, right? Just like whatever, a whatever bottle of coquito, yeah, exactly. And so, um, my mom's rum cake became something that was um, something that made me think of the holidays um, as a flavor that I loved. And then it was one of the first things that I figured out how to make on my own as an adult. Um, I'm not a very good baker, but it's because my mom's recipe is very similar to a classic Bacardi cake recipe. And Mm -hmm. so it uses a box of um, box cake mix and then with a few adjusted ingredients. So as a novice baker, it um, it is quite easy to prepare. It's got a box of cake mix, a box of, um, you know, of dried pudding mix and then a handful of other ingredients that you can find literally like at a bodega. They're all (laughs) super easy to find. Um, And um, and if you'd like in my book, um, there is a recipe for for people who really want to make their own cake mix it's totally delicious as well but i still think that the box cake mix is the most delicious and that's still the one that i prepare oh no oh no 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 i don't es know, que rico. Es que rico. I, know. You know? I, I, bueno. I i i co-sign i love rum cake though i do love a rum cake i would probably put it. too much you should try it chef plum it's, I, I, I i might i may convert you i'm gonna i'm gonna try it i'm gonna post on instagram and i'll tag you but you, i might use more rum than you use maybe it's just that's me. fine i use plenty <laughs> <laughs> hey our producer catrice claudio asked her followers where they go for their best puerto rican food in the state and some of the responses we got were pretty great. Catrice, actually, she loves Crolissimo Restaurant in New Britin. Crioissimo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, did I say it wrong? No, you said it like a gringo. I uh, still love well, you. You know, that's what it 
this. Uh, <laughs> Katrin Evans and Bloomfield co-signed that also. Uh, Megan Rice uh, of Columbia likes Latin flavor in Willimantic. And Jocelyn Cerda of Hartford is shouting out Umacao Restaurant and Lounge in East Hartford. And El Bori Food Truck gets a shout out for the best cuchifritos on the mm. go. Yeah, that's awesome. I would love to try that too. And Christina Riviera of Plantsville recommends, oh, I'm not, you should La Placita one. de yep. Mofongo. I mean, I could have done it, Manchester. but it wouldn't have been as good as that. It's Absolutely. Okay. It's totally fine. <laughs> There's lots of greats. I mean, it's amazing how many, during the show, just the research, how many great Puerto Rican restaurants and food trucks there are in our state. Yeah. As we sort of wind down this episode, I wonder if each of you, Vaughn and Maria, can just give us your your thoughts on what you would like our listeners and beyond to think about when they think about Puerto Rican food. Vaughn, why don't we start with you? You know, I think this is maybe a, a great kind of wrap up for all of what y'all have, all of what we've talked about in this, um, in the show so far, where we've talked about a lot of really traditional, classic Puerto Rican dishes and flavors. And I think what I'd, what I'd like people to know more broadly is that Puerto Rican food is so much more than that today. Um, chefs on the island and on the mainland, even here in Durham, North Carolina, there is, um, there's a new restaurant called Bendito um, that's run by a, a, a chef I'll give him a shout out, Kevin Ruiz. He just opened it. He's a young chef and is doing really dynamic stuff that's focused on the flavor profiles, the ingredients, the balance of flavors that are quintessentially Puerto Rico. You know, the 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 what um, the, the foundations of sofrito itself and how you can use that as a launch pad for layering different kinds of flavors on top of things and how adaptable Puerto Rican flavors really are. So, you know, I, I, I love all of the dishes that we've talked about and, and and y'all know every holiday, those are still the things that I make, right? Because because they're, you know, they're they make me feel like I'm home, yeah. but like a deep home deep in my heart. And Puerto Rican cooks all over in the diaspora and on the island are getting really creative and really innovative and playing with flavors that um, that that honestly um, that potentially folks weren't that into before, but they've been really pushing the envelope and encouraging um, encouraging the cuisine to stay alive, right? And to not just sort of be stuck in this place where it's this heavy holiday food, right? It is it is you know mm-hmm. radishes with exo sauce. It is fresh caught fish with like just the lightest amount. I mean, it's all sorts of really dynamic flavors. And um, and I want to encourage folks to, to explore those flavors as well. I'm still going to make the rum cake. <laughs> Maria, what about you? <laughs> well, I mean, I can speak as a chef, I guess, about the subject. The way that I like to encourage people to eat Puerto Rican food is on, on my menus. I like to highlight and explain it to people as best as I can um, by using things that we use all the time. Like, let's say I have an empanada, which here is like a breaded cutlet of pork. Um, but I explain it to them like, you know, this is schnitzel. Technically, mm. it's the same mm. thing. When I'm using local pork and maybe that spatzo is going to have some recal. So I like to speak a language that both people can understand and still uh, highlight our food. Um, or maybe in a restaurant where I try to do a, a classic goat stew, but instead I put it inside a dumpling and do a sauce with the a jus from the from the stew of the goat and add a little five spice. And all of a sudden it's a language that becomes a little bit more international, but still playing and paying homage to the local food. Absolutely. I want to eat those goat dumplings That's right, right. Now. right now. Chef Maria <laughs> Mercedes Grab is the executive chef at Taberna Medalla and the Decanter Hotel in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Von Diaz is a writer, documentarian, professor of food studies at UNC Chapel Hill. She's the author of Coconuts and Collards, Recipes from Puerto Rico to the Deep South. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. And thank you to everyone who called. Season is produced by Robin Doyen-Aiken, Katie Tolarski, Emily Cherish, Catrice Claudio, and Jean Amatrudo. Thanks for running the board today. We appreciate it. I'm Chef Plum. And I'm Marisol Castro. Thanks so much for listening. See you all next week. Mm-hmm.